Hello, and welcome to all who are joining me on this presentation on Lightroom. We're going to talk about how to edit photos with both versions of Classic and Creative Cloud. This presentation is brought to you by the UNM Tech Days. The University of New Mexico has this yearly event, and unfortunately this year it's been online. But hey, I'm enjoying it, so let's hope you do too. I am part of the UNM Continuing Ed in the Digital Arts section. I teach Photoshop and Photography. By way of introduction, my name is Mary Elkins. I am a commercial photographer. My husband owns this Mini Cooper called Yeller Sub. It's a pretty amazing car, and we've driven it all over the Southwest. And of course, it's better to go with your friends. My husband, Steve, made a club called New Mexico Mini Motoring. Its intent was to find fast, curvy roads and scenic sites. Somehow, the cars kind of overtake the scenic, but hey, there are babies. Adobe has created a creative campus program, and UNM has been invited to join it. If you've signed up for Creative Cloud, you will have access to a number of programs. Have you opened up InDesign? How about Dreamweaver? And if anyone has tried Premiere Pro, you have my congratulations. Photoshop began in 1988. It's gone through a lot of iterations. They've added, expanded, made it much more complex. It's a quite a powerful program. I love Photoshop. It allows me to create amazing, beautiful photographs such as this. If you've ever tried to photograph from inside a house, you'll notice some of the problems that cameras have in capturing such a scene. If you set it up so that the windows show the view, the room's probably too dark. If you open up the f-stop until the room looks good, the windows go white. I have layered together a number of images. You'll look over on the right-hand side of our workspace. There's a group of six layers that represent how I combined multiple images to create this lovely scene. Around the turn of the century, photographers be were searching for programs that could help them keep track of where their images are and do developing. So photo, aperture, iPhoto, even Photoshop elements were useful to a lot of people to catalog and develop their images. The folks at Adobe took note of that and in 2007 put out a beta version of Lightroom as a sister companion to Photoshop. It took a few years for them to actually get it into the format we know now, but it is a powerhouse for cataloging and organizing your images. The develop module gives you lots of options for how to alter or upgrade your image. It's still a very user-friendly version, much easier than Photoshop, and the results are more apparent with less learning. Finally, once you've got the image looking the way you want, you will export it into a file format such as TIFF or JPEG and then size it according to your end usage. And it's all very easy to do with Lightroom. Oh, once again, we have another change up in our digital world, the iPhone. The camera that came with the phone and its limited processing process allows everyone to become a photographer. So that little gadget that's with us day and night, I think all of us know how to use the camera. The Adobe folks again took note of it, created a, another version of Lightroom, which is geared more toward developing images on a mobile device, such as your phone. So two versions of Lightroom, one called Classic, one CC. We're going to, in this program, talk about the differences between these two and perhaps give you some reasons for how to choose one over the other. I will put up examples of both workspaces and talk about how they are similar and a few differences. Finally, I will show you some of the ways that we can use the developing section of both programs to improve images. 
Take note of the two icons. The original has got square corners and the new one a little looser. As I said, Classic was developed in 2007, back when photographers were accustomed to downloading images off their cameras and bringing the files into a computer or laptop, which meant that the photographer had to make decisions as to where the images were going to go and what the naming structure for those folders were. So a number of different systems have been developed by people according to how they want to remember where images go. This particular photographer has put his images into the pictures section of his PC. You'll notice that the photographer had a chance to drive through the Southwest on a two week trip, going from Carlsbad through Grand Canyon into the Mesa Verde. I'm actually kind of jealous that they got to do this for two weeks. I've been to a lot of these places, but not all at the same time. The naming protocol set up by this photographer is to start out with the year, the date, the month, and the day, which allows them to be uh, filed in sequence according to when they were photographed. Then he adds a description to help him remember where the photographs were taken. Lightroom Classic was set up as a companion to Photoshop, and so the, it has a lot of advantages for the professional photographer, but it also has a very user-friendly format which helps the beginner begin to have some immediate wonderful effects easily learned and and then you can spend your time exploring all of the different tools and developing modules to uh, change up the image in a form that you want it to see. Finally, access to Photoshop is one of my primary reasons for learning the program. Let's take a look at how this process works using both Lightroom and Photoshop to change up this image into something that's acceptable. This is how I would like it to look. This is how the camera saw it. So we need to work in, a, in the developing section of Lightroom to take a look at it. Once I have done my magic, and I will go through later in this program how I got to this point, um, but first what I'm trying to show you here is how Lightroom and Photoshop work in concert with each other. So I've done my magic in Lightroom, and I'm about ready to send it out. This image was created to help sell the house and its view from the top balcony. However, the view includes the neighbor's backyard. <laughs> not exactly scenic. The only way I'm going to be able to repair the backyard is to take it into Photoshop. From Lightroom Classic, I, I find the Edit In section under Photo. It will open up in Lightroom. You can tell that it's, it's Photoshop because of the tools down the left-hand side. The tool I want to use is called Clone Stamp. I will copy pixels from various places in the ground of the backyard to remove the offensive objects. Saving the file as a TIFF, it returns back to the folder that it came from. Lightroom will recognize it, show it as being in the folder next to the original capture. Now I'm ready to export it into a form that the real estate agent can use. That form generally for web is a JPEG. We'll talk a little bit later on about some of these file formats. I convert the file suitable for an MLS listing, send it off to the agent, and they put it up on their website. As I said, this is a powerhouse of a program for keeping track of where your images are. A friend of mine has a eight terabyte drive that he has filled up and the catalog is keeping track of 700,000 images. The editing or developing section is pretty amazing. It again is a very user-friendly format and it allows us to access the power of tools in Photoshop. 
Finally, we export into the various formats that we might need. If you're using an image for the internet, such as for your uh, social media, you would want to have a different file size than for making prints. That is, again, made very easy through uh, that section of Lightroom. In contrast, our CC version is um, taking advantage of the server farms that are out there now to store all of the images that we have. The folders are set up at a different structure by date. The camera will record the date of capture and put that into the digital file. The software program will read that date and put the images into folders, very similar to what you're accustomed to on your phone. So CC is a, a lighter version of the program. It, um, again, its big advantage is the availability of accessing the images wherever you are and whatever device you're working on. The format looks a little different on the laptop versus the phone, mainly because of the amount of space that's available to work with the image, and you still have to have enough room to be able to use your finger to move the dials. As you work on the images, the program will record your changes back to the digital format that the file is saved in. And once you pick up a different device, such as a laptop, you will be able to see the changes that were done on the iPad or the phone. That is called non-destructive editing. What I've shown up here on this screen is my work version of classic. The folders on the left are tiny type. The, fold, the panel on the right, again, looks pretty complex. There's a lot of things going on in this format. The CC version has been simplified primarily because it's been designed for smaller platforms. So there's less stuff showing up on the screen. So just remember that the CC, the classic version was designed back in the days when people were accustomed to using the mouse or a Wacom tablet to control the cursor. Uh, this file structure is a little bit different than the one I showed you earlier. It is my work structure. So it shows the folders that have been named according to the project or the client's name. Again, the CC version, the program puts it into dates. If you want to keep track of images without needing to scroll back and back and back, you can create albums. I have an album for my cat, flowers, people. If you're working in the regular classic version, the what is called albums in the CC is called collections in classic. Revealing all the images, put them in a montage. It's very easy to grab my cat pictures and move them over to the album that says cat. Each time you click on an album, it will reveal the images that have been stored there, no matter where they come from. Let's take a look at the develop modules and compare them. The left-hand side is classic, the right side is CC. Again, the classic version has smaller type, more things going on. The right side, the uh, little circles are big enough to use your finger. We start out with what's called the basic. In this developing section, we can change the color, contrast, exposure, and add sharpening on vibrance. The CC version is a little more simplistic, not quite as many choices, but again, it gives us the powerhouse of highlights and shadows and, and vibrance, among other things. So let's take a look at how this works in Classic. So our workspace, when we open it up, again, as I said, it looks pretty complex. We have panels left and right. This is where we name or 
uh, reveal the folders that we've gotten imported into the software program. We can have subfolders. They can be brought in to the program either from the computer or external hard drives. The film strip reveals what images are inside that folder. The right hand side starts out with a histogram. You'll see that this is a representation of the values of that image. There's a lot of blue in these sky images. So that's why we have the blue bumps. In order to keep um, a lot of information available on this program, they have little pages that are folded away. So for example, if I take the triangle next to quick develop, turn it down, it will open up the page that's hidden there. It's something that I may or may not want to have open all the time. So I close it out. The metadata is one that I refer to a lot. So I often have that one open. It tells me the file name. It allows me to change the file name there. I can type in caption, titles, copyright information, and keywords in addition to the camera information. So those are the four main sections of our workspace. When we click on an image, it can be revealed as a single view, what we call loop. This is the grid view. Toward the bottom of our workspace are these little icons. Photoshop has done a lot of work on creating icons that help us decipher quickly what is going on with when we click on that little icon. So the grid view, you can also, instead of taking your cursor to that little icon, use the keystroke G for grid. E is loop or simply double click on the image. Moving down the film strip, we'll reveal the different images. I'm going to take this image into the develop section. So this is how library looks. Develop's a little different. The panels change out into different because we're going to have different uses for what we're going to do with this, pot, with this develop section. We're going to start out with the basic grouping. First of all, take a look at the image. Not bad, pretty nice. But if we wanted to change up the quality of the image, sometimes just going to the temperature lines and making some changes according to how you want to see this scene. I have taken a number of different changes here in the what we call the tone section. So the exposure has gone one way, highlights and shadows have gone different ways. See how all the little triangles are in different places on their lines. Also, we have numbers that represent how far those triangles have been moved. So the original capture, the new altered version of the image. It's sort of complex starting out. What choices do I make? Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I, you know? So they've given us this wonderful little section of presets. In our develop basic panel, you'll see the eyedropper and above it is the word profile. When you click on that, it rolls out a number of choices, one of which is browse. By clicking on browse, it gives us a grouping of a number of ways an image can be changed up according to presets. So if I click on vivid, not much of a change, but it actually is pretty nice. Black and white is a difficult area to actually learn. And so by having a number of presets, we can quickly figure out which version of black and white is going to work best for our vision of the translation into black and white. Here's a choice for out of the modern, modern group and the vivid. Not exactly my favorite version. So 
how do we use the developing tools with an image that is as difficult as this? We want it to look more like that because that's how we see it when we're standing at the scene with our eyes and our brain. But this is how the camera sees it. We're gonna to have to develop the section, the image in sections because there's such a difference between the top and the bottom of the image. Not too hard to figure out that the foreground is dark. All right, so here we have our developing section. If we take our exposure to the left, which will darken down the image and make the sky look better, doesn't help the foreground. So if we take now the exposure to the right, the sky goes away. The tool that we want to use is called the gradiated filter. It will help us work in a section of the image. I want you to imagine a window shade that's attached at the bottom of the window. You grab the tab and can roll up and down the shade. I select the gradiated filter. I take the cursor down to the bottom of the image, click and pull up. Think, think of a window shade. You're going to take the cursor, click and pull up and create an adjustment. That is represented by the green ooze that's showing up from the bottom of the image. This is called a mask. The maximum effect is going to happen below the middle white line. Above that line, it's going to fade out to nothing. Because I want the adjustment to happen over all of the foreground, I'm going to squeeze those lines closer together at the horizon. The mask helps us take a look at how that adjustment is going to happen. Between the top two lines, you'll see that the green gradually fades away to nothing. I am going to use two adjustments to open up the foreground values. Exposure gets lighter. And this line called shadows opens up the darker values, particularly in the trees. So that there's a little more information in the darks. Well, that's pretty good. Now, how about what we can do to the sky? I pick up the gradient tool again. I turn it on. And I start from the top this time and pull down below the horizon line. You'll see two little dots in my image. The black dot is the current active gradient. And the silver dot is the previous version that we had drawn. Very simple to take the exposure line to the left to darken down the sky. One really, really powerful tool that I use a lot is called dehaze. It will add a little more contrast to the sky. Now, some of you may notice that there's kind of what we call banding happening in the top of the image as I go through this. That is happening mainly because of the, trans the translation of this image into a, um, a smaller JPEG. So in the real image, that banding will not appear. Not bad. The number of steps didn't take us very much time. And then again, as I want to take it into Photoshop to do the clone stamp tool, to open up the foreground and send it out. Another module in Lightroom is called Book. This is my niece's wedding in Michigan. They have a little more green up there for some reason. The book has a number of templates. You can put a number of images on a page, or you can put a single image across two pages. The templates are a lot to choose from. You can add text. You um, uh, can crop images easily and readjust them according to what you need for the book. It is a process that will take some time to learn. There are plenty of tutorials. And I would suggest sitting down with an afternoon intent of learning how to do the program. But once you get the idea going, um, you'll find it a lot of fun to work with. So that's classic. How about CC? 
Remember, it's based on storing your images up in the cloud so that it's accessible on a number of different devices. Because it's in the cloud, it's, you don't have to back it up, but you do have to pay for the storage. Going to your Adobe account, you can find out how much of the storage you have used up. Generally, it runs $10 per terabyte per month. As I said, you don't have to worry so much about backup. So if your computer system fails, those images are still there and available on all of your devices. Such is the power of the internet today. The format on the different devices will look different. You can synchronize from your main computer into the Lightroom CC version of the program. So you can run both Classic and Lightroom CC simultaneously. Just remember that in order to access it on a device that needs the internet, you need to have access to the internet. So, so there are places out here in New Mexico where there's no internet. And then use whatever developing process you want to use on your phone. Just a quick note, the phone actually only saves a what's called a smart preview. It's a small file that just gives you a rendition of what the image looks like. The file itself is actually in the internet. When you want to edit it, the phone will download the file, bring it into the, the phone, you process it, and then store whatever changes you have made back to the cloud. That's called non-destructive editing. You have the same kind of system of presets. Some of them are actually a lot of fun to play with. In the developing section, there is this thing called Color Mixer. It is made up of eight different colors. So you can go in and adjust a single color, be it red or blue or yellow. The photographer shown here has captured an image in which the truck is not to her liking color-wise. The choice that she made was to go into the blue section, which means that her changes are not going to affect the green of the trees. It will affect a little bit the color of the brown Labrador. So by selecting blue, going to the hue line and playing with it, she discovered the color cyan that the truck now exists. She also added a little saturation and darkened it down a bit. So just working within the blue made that change to the image without affecting the green in the trees. With your fingertip, you can make a selection. For example, the building is a bit dark. The sky is with the right value. So with your finger drawing over the building, the program analyzes edges and keeps its selection within the building, not on the, on the sky. And then you can lighten it up. This is non-destructive editing. The changes that you made are recorded into the files and then read by your computer, your phone. There are a number of tutorials available and some of them are actually quite interesting. The format of what's on your regular computer screen has a section for edit, section for folders. If you want to add images from your computer, you go to the top left-hand corner, check and find. It will bring up your finder window. You'll find the folder where the images are recorded select those images, bring them into the program. If you don't want an image to be imported into the catalog, uncheck the little checks. Once you've made your selection, so you go to the top right corner and add those images. It shows up under the recently added section on the left-hand panel. I would suggest at that point to create an album because that is easily accessible and you don't have to remember the date. 
the little plus sign in the albums part of this panel will allow you to name the album and then it'll show up as a group and that's a lot easier to remember than the dates. We have several different ways to reveal the images within our workspace. The photo grid has a montage of images. The square grid allows for information to be added around the edges of the images, such as whether you put stars on them or whether you developed the image. The detail reveals the image as a full screen image within your workspace. You can always change up the order of the images by going to the sorting section. You can uh, have them revealed according to file names or star ratings or your capture dates. There's a number of ways to sort up the images. On the right hand lower section, we have three different ways to put the image into our workspace. Fit will reveal the entire image. You'll see that there's some gray left over on the right hand side. But if you go to fill, it expands the image until it fills the amount of workspace you're given for this image. One to one will expand it to the original full value of the image. And then from there, you can scan around the image using the mouse or your finger. If you have enough room, it might be handy to have the film strip revealed. If you want to know more information that's stored with the file, the lower right hand corner has an I, which brings up places where you can add more information, such as title, copyright, state and country. and the camera information. Let's take a look at the edit section. The edit bar is where we've taken a fair amount of time looking at the basic edit where you change up your little draw bars. Cropping will, will uh, change how much of the image is shown. The healing, brush, linear, and radial tools are quite useful for making changes in an image. As we go down the list, you'll see the name revealed and its keystroke. So the keystroke for crop is C. Let's develop an image in Lightroom CC. It will be similar to some of the things that we learned in Classic. So again, I've given you a contrasty scene and we want it to look more like this. First of all, I often go to the, the temperature line because my preference to see an image is a little more on the yellow side. So I just simply play with the temperature line until I get the color of the image looking to my satisfaction. Evaluating, not too hard. We've got to make some changes in the darks and the light areas of this image. I love shadows. It is really easy to use. You'll see by taking the shadow marker all the way to the right, we now have more information in the areas that were really, really dark. Highlights is affecting the light values of the image. So you'll see a little more information showing up in the clouds. That has also darkened everything down, the old, whole overall image. So we're going to take the exposure line and move it a little bit to the right to lighten the image up so that things are in better balance. The final thing to make sure that we've got enough contrast is to set the white and black points. We have two lines for those. You'll notice that they don't move very much often. So let's take a little closer look. Original, moved highlights and shadows. So original, highlights and shadows. Add black and white points. A little more sparkle, a little more contrast. We can still do some more work selectively by using the tools that we talked about before. The gradient tool comes down from the top. 
I take the cursor or my fingertip to the top of the image, draw it down toward the horizon line. I have revealed the mask by taking my cursor over the blue dot and it will reveal where our adjustments are going to happen and they fade away and do not affect the bottom part of this image, only the top. The tool Linear Gradient, when it's opened up, shows a number of ways that we can adjust what's under the mask. So I can take the exposure to lighten, I can take the whites down, I can add dehazing, saturation, noise, all kinds of different changes are available to us in this tool. You'll see again the three lines where the maximum effect is above the middle line and it fades away to the bottom line. So first I'm gonna open up the exposure and then desaturate, in other words, take away some of the brightness of the yellow on the Latias. How about the brush? This is another place where we can do a selection of just part of the image. I've used the brush to rub over the chairs and the tables in the foreground. The mask shows you where that selection is going to happen. Again, as I take the cursor over the blue dot, it will reveal the mask. We're given again a number of choices where we can make changes to the area that is underneath the mask. I want to lighten the foreground, take the whites back down, and then desaturate just a touch. Much better. So this is where we came from. This is where we're going to end up. Once I have the image, I can then save it into a format by exporting. The Photoshop world will use these formats such as JPEG and TIFF, those are probably familiar to you. PSD may not be raw. I don't know if you capture in your normal camera, you have a choice of shooting in JPEG or raw. There is a new file system created by Apple fairly recently called HEIC. The number of images that the Apple file system has to keep track of is in the billions. I mean, people are photographing every day and creating new and new and new images. And so there's got to be a problem storing all those images. The uh, system is set up to compress the files. It works better than the old JPEG version, which was created 40, 50 years ago. And so this is a file compression that retains a high quality of image, but yet maintains a much low, a smaller file size. If you don't want to shoot in HEIC, you have to go into your settings and change it to what's called most compatible, and then it will store the image as JPEGs. If you want the option of actually keeping them as HEICs, but you want to send them out as JPEGs so that somebody who doesn't have an Apple system can read the images, you have to again go into settings and set it up so that your output goes out as JPEGs. And then you get to keep the HEIC as, as the Apple formatted files on your phone. Lightroom and Photoshop will read both of these file formats. If you don't have those programs, you'll need to have a converter such as iMazing. It's a translation service. So again, up until recently, all phones photographed as JPEGs. Your main camera will have the option of shooting as JPEG, RAW, or both. If you go into your menu section, you'll set up how the file is captured off of the sensor and what file format it is saved in. You can save both RAW and JPEG on the single capture. In my Photoshop class, I talk about the differences between JPEGs and RAW and why you want to shoot RAW. 
The JPEG format is set up to be fast loading. So for programs like Facebook or Instagram, it, or sending things out in email, that is pretty much the go-to format, JPEG. TIFF is used when we're working on large files, particularly if we're going to take them into Photoshop. And then if we're going to send them out for reproduction in a magazine or print. So that's a very short guide to file formats. There are a number of tutorials out there. If you want to get into the Adobe system, open up your favorite browser, type in Adobe Tutorials, then Photoshop or Lightroom, and it will take you to a page that looks something like this, with a number of short videos that talk about different small sections of how the program is used. They will also give you access to download the images so that you can work on the images along with the tutorial. Thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end on my short but delightful little presentation on Lightroom. It's part of our access through the Adobe Creative Campus. I'm with the UNM Continuing Ed and brought to you by Tech Days. Now, it's your turn to go play.